session together. Today, we've got a really special guest. We've got Brian Duncan, who is uh, the executive director of eye care in uh, North Carolina and also uh, president of the Community Action Partnership, uh, president of the board. So Brian, thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time because I know how busy you are, but thanks for joining us today. Absolutely, uh, glad to be here. Let, let me start off with a little bit different uh, question from uh, what I've asked people in the past, and that is now with COVID-19, with the uh, economic uh, calamity, the collapse, and now with, with the, uh, all the events post uh, George Floyd's murder, what's it mean for you in, in, uh, in North Carolina? Uh, what's it mean for your agency and how are you dealing with all of this? Yeah, David, it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy, honestly. Um, you know, the reality is um, we are dealing with two pandemics. Uh, we're dealing with COVID-19, you know, uh, that's a very fluid situation. Uh, we're dealing with the social pandemic that is racism that led to the murder of George Floyd and countless others across the country. Um, locally, um, actually, you know, agencies and city and county leaders they really look to us for leadership um, you know through these times especially um, with regard to you know the, the the issues that are dealing with race you know just because of the populations that we serve uh, the, the, the places and the, the, the structure of our board you know we're very diverse and we serve everybody and we have relationships with everybody and so not many agencies can truly say that and so we've been able to develop um, you know, those relationships over years. And I dare say probably most cap agencies across the country are in the same position. And I think that it really has put us in a very good uh, position to negotiate and to, to build consensus towards change. Well, I, I've known of iCare for years, obviously, for, because of your leadership. But I've known the quality work that you do. Is there um, since the perfect storm that has hit America right now, the uh, everything we're facing. Have, have expectations on the role that the CAP can provide and play in the community increased in the last few weeks? Yes, yes, they definitely have. Um, I'm getting calls and emails from people I have not heard from, you know, before. I've been here 14 years. Uh, I've been invited to speak. Um, on several occasions um, with different elected bodies. Um, just everyone really seems to be in more of a position of willingness to listen now, and they recognize and respect our voice. And so I think all of that is changing. I think it's changing for the good. I really do. Yeah, you know, if, if you look back, it's sort of a generalization, but, but what America is facing right now is a combination of 1918, 1929, 1968, and um, all at the same time, which is uh, no one foresaw this. Um, do you think? Do you think in your community, your cap, your leadership can help that community heal and play a role that says this time it's different. This time we're going to deal and, and, and start solving our problems? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, and I think we're seeing evidence of that now, uh, just by virtue of the phone calls, the questions that we are getting, and the invitations that we're getting. Um, I've actually reached out to community leaders uh, with the willingness to, to host and convene. One of the things I think about, uh, even when re reviewing some of uh, the, the, the documentation that you have sent out, in terms of what is CSBG, what are community action agencies? And the word that sticks out to me is we are a convener. You know, we are a convener. We bring voices together. We bring those voices to the table. And we reach those uh, decisions, those conclusions, those solutions, if you will, you know, to, to help everyone improve. And I think we're in that same environment right now, probably more so than, than ever before, just because of the perfect storm of events that have transpired over the last you know, year or so. Are there partnerships that might not have been necessary or visible 
in the past that you need to develop going forward? Yes, um, I definitely think that, well, there may not be new ones. I think we have to um, probably rebuild some that may have, um, you know, lessened their activity with regard to community action agencies over time. And one being the faith community. Um, the faith community is very important in the work that we have to have going forward, you know, but they also have to understand what our role is, you know, what our role is. And, and so I've had a group of pastors already reach out to me, you know, want to know, hey, can we sit down and talk about solutions? You know, that would have never happened before. We have, we have faith representation on our boards, but to come to us in a group fashion with a sincere willingness to, to listen, learn, and work on solutions, that hasn't happened. You know, we've had municipal governments, that's always been present. You know, we've had the other partnering agencies, you know, that's been there. Um, but I, I see a rise in the level of um, interest and sincere interest from the faith community. The, um, the three crises that we face, the perfect storm, as we've talked about, they will dramatically change, I think, going forward. Uh, expectations, need, respect, awareness of your community action agency. Is there, um, how, how is those, how are those changes being implemented uh, with either your board or your staff? How, what, what are you envisioning going forward uh, after, after some of the temperature drops a little bit on all of these issues? Um, I think we will recognize um, new service delivery models um, that, you know, I have a, I have a good friend that's, uh, that we work pretty closely with who leads a um, healthcare system here. And one thing he told me, he said, I think the country will realize um, fewer brick and mortar um, healthcare offices. Yeah. I also think that community action may experience the same thing to some respect. Um, what we realize is that we can deliver services, you know, in a remote fashion, and we can do it effectively. We still have to have some meeting space because we also recognize that everyone does not have, you know, access to, to broadband. And so, but now the question becomes, do I truly need a 6,500 square foot building to deliver services? Do I need a large conference room anymore? You know, can I re- um, allocate, can I re, you know, reappropriate those dollars to better serve clients as opposed to um, utilizing for space, energy, phone, and, and so on and so forth. So I think all of that is going to change. Those are questions I think we're all going to be faced with asking ourselves. But on the other side of this, I do believe that we will all be more efficient. And I think we will uh, figure out how to best serve, better serve our clients. One, one of the things that you've talked to me over the years is your pride of who serves on your board. Uh, you, your board, you often said, your board has your back to do, to, to lead, to be a leader in the community. How's the board uh, responded to, you know, the crises, plural, that we're facing now? Yes, they've been, uh, been very supportive as, as, as they've always been. Um, actually, very interested in um, reaching, you know, new solutions to things. You know, I, I, my board chair is always like, you know, we've done this this way and been successful at it uh, for so long, for a very long time. We've been moving people out of poverty. We've been getting people employed, you know, been reaching all kinds of outcomes. But what can we do different now? You know, and that's the conversation I think that the board, our board particularly, is having uh, with regard to, you know, what we've seen in the last, you know, week or so, a couple of weeks, um, now it's about, hey, we need to be leading this conversation with regard to, you know, changes in structural and institutional racism here in the county. That's what we're here for. And so I think all of that is a result of um, them really leaning in and, and learning the true history of community action. You know, I'm always preaching that history. And, and we were born in the midst of the civil rights movement. And we've always been involved in social justice work in addition to this. We can't talk about poverty without talking about race. And, and different than 68 or different than 92, um, this time we've got an opportunity to move the ball 
substantially forward. It, it feels different than it ever has in our past. Um, speaking of boards, you're president of the National Community Action uh, Partnership. How's these crises affecting that organization, affecting the board, and how is your mission changing, uh, your, your vision changing, particularly on behalf of the network? Yes. Um, you know, I think oftentimes, you know, the network members may not consider the fact that, that you know, the NCAP staff, the Community Action Partnership staff, you know, they work in an office environment also, because the only time most people see them are out, you know. And so, you know, they were immediately faced with the same challenges that everyone else has, how to ramp up, how to work remotely. I do believe they were ahead of the curve because they, you know, we've got some staff that were already working in a remote environment from other parts of the country. Um, but what we had to do was to say, all right, well, how can we best serve the network? What are the things that we think that the network is going to need? That's where the true benefit comes in from having those different voices around the table from all regions of the country. Say, this is going on over here on the West Coast. This is in region one, region two. You know, we're seeing different things. We we're able to, you know, respond directly to those needs. Uh, we were put out some guiding principles for the network agencies to consider in dealing with the COVID-19 recovery. You know, we sought additional funding with other national partners to help mitigate, you know, the response of the, the effects of COVID-19 on minority communities. You know, we were even on a call, which was good to know, and this is, uh, you know, certainly the tip of the hat to you also, you know, we were on a, a national nonprofits call with the president. So, you know, we were on his radar. You know, I don't know that there was much uh, back and forth, but, you know, uh, we, were, we were at the table. Large so, table. So that's a good, absolutely, yeah, it was a large table, large table, but look, look we weren't being served. So, right. <laughs> so um, focusing on racial equity, you know, that's, you know, that's our reality. You know, that's our reality. And, and, and so we've been able to put out some statements uh, to the network, reaffir reaffirming our values. Uh, we recognize that structural and institutional um, inequities exist and given even agencies action items, things that they could do in their local communities to start making some of the changes that are necessary for us to move forward. You know, this won't happen overnight, but I think we put some good, good things in place. And, and expectations from, from, from my vantage point, expectations on the partnership to me, have been modified. Uh, before, it might be quality, it might be organizational standards, it might be training and technical assistance, traditional roles of a trade association. Now, all of what this country is facing, and a partnership is also true with NCAF, but on the partnership, they expect more. And that if we truly are committed to addressing poverty, and its, cause, its root causes and its effects and moving that needle uh, and making forward progress, it is a much more complicated question. So the expectations I would think on, on the partnership have really ramped up. Absolutely they have. And uh, I think as evidence of that, we have, you know, we've really been forced to, to look at thought leaders uh, around those topics, you know, um, we are, we, you know, we're the, the probably the, the, the world, the, the, the country's best lab uh, with regard to issues of poverty, you know, but we've also had to, to, to really depend on, you know, other academic professionals to, to kind of, hey, what are you seeing out here? Bringing in those, you know, listening to the voices of the, the Raj Chetties and the, the different voices about, you know, the data, um, that type of thing, and how it's affecting, you know, rural America versus urban America, and, and really giving guidance to agencies um, along those lines. I mean, it is truly, it is truly more than just trade association work like it used to be, right. it really is. And, and, and I think we have a, a great leader um, who has her ear to the ground and also is, is a visionary and, and, and she has a great team working around her. And we have a great board, we really do. The part of the, the need or the expectations with, with the partnership are to remind and reinforce with the network that it's not business as usual, that we can make change if we're all committed. And so they, to me, they, they look to you and, and, your, and the partnership team uh, 
to reinforce, yeah, this time we can do it. I mean, we're all in this together, but we can do it. So that's uh, an added, added responsibility that you and Denise and the whole partnership team must be feeling. Absolutely. And, and you know, so there is a bit of cheerleading involved. There really is. Um, because agencies are really faced with a lot right now. And that's been one of my concerns, just about the, the, just the sheer mental health of, of agency staff. And so there is a degree of cheerleading that's necessary to, to continue to, to get, uh, have our agencies understand that, hey, we can do this. We can do this. We've got, you know, we've got good directions. We've got a plan. We just need you to just, just hang on. Just hang on. You know, we're going to get there. And some days, you know, it's, it, it does get a little, it gets a little tiring. It gets exhausting, you know, but I think we can always lean on each other. And that's the beauty of our network, that we have such, such tight knit relationships, man, that you can always pick up the phone and call somebody, you know, and get that inspiration that you might need for that day. Yeah, I think, I think that's an important role and remind people that, you know, we, we can do it this time. It's not like we can do it, but we must do it. So, so Brian, my my sense is is that uh, your energy has not flagged. You're you're up for this fight. You're up for this challenge, both locally and nationally, and and that's a terrific thing, and it's needed in in community action. So I just I just want to thank you, and I've known you for a long time, and you're you're a good friend. Uh, I think we're awfully lucky and fortunate that you've uh, given your career to community action. And you've taken it a step further and, and your willingness to lead uh, this national program. Uh, it's not a perfect program, but together, collectively, we can all continue to make it better and more importantly, continue to make America better, which is what you're all about. I appreciate it. So, so Brian, let me end with one final question. Um, what do you need? What, what, uh, what, what additional resources or recognition what do you need to be continue to be successful at a national level and a local level you know i, I think the the probably the most common answer we probably when you answer that ask that question is probably money you know it's probably money you know you know the funds are good but the, i think the funds have to be coordinated though you know we have to have some coordination of the funding um you know and then you know that gives us our direction and so, you know, I would certainly say, yes, we still need funding. We still have a lot of need out here. We have a lot of need. And unfortunately, I think the needs, the suffering of the people, we will see towards the latter part of the year and beyond. Um, because when we think about what has happened up until now, COVID hit, people were getting taxes. We got $1,200 check, you know, whatever that money was, you know, per household. And then unemployment you know, you got an additional $600. Well, all that's going to come to an end. It's going to come to a crashing halt. And I think funds are going to be more important than ever at that time because it's going to be a while, I think, before a lot of people are able to gain back uh, their employment or at least uh, their lifestyle at the, at, the, at the level that they were. Well, NCAF's, one of our roles is to make sure you get money. The billion helps. I'm disappointed in the slowness in money, but hopefully it's starting to trickle out. I look forward to a day that that uh, you tell me that, Bradley, we've got all the money we need. I also look forward to the day that, that you and I collectively say, you know what, in America's time of crisis, community action is there, and we help solve the three crises that America's facing now. So, Brian Duncan, thank you for your leadership, as always. Thank you for your commitment, and uh, stay safe, and uh, tell, the cap, uh, tell the staff at ICARE that everyone in Community Action is proud of, of their agency and the work that they're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Be safe. Yeah, you too, Brian.